I'm Stefan Bauman. I would like to invite you on a special journey to discover the splendor, encounter the grandeur, feel the excitement. Come along with me as we experience the thrill of painting outdoors. A three-day journey that will change your art forever. In one of America's most stunning locations, Mount Shasta. Everything you need to know is on our website, www.stephanbauman.com. I'm Stephen Bauman and welcome to the Grand View. I would like to invite you on a journey to discover the Grand Canyon's North Rim and witness for yourself as I capture this magnificent place on canvas. Painting on location in a magical place like this will transform your art forever. So sit back and relax and witness for yourself as I capture the Grand Canyon, the North Rim. I'm so excited about our painting today. The Grand Canyon is one of my favorite places to paint, and especially the North Rim. The vistas from up here are just spectacular and make for a very unique painting. So without further ado, let's get started. I'm going to take my cobalt blue, my alizarin, and my cad yellow. I also want to squeeze out a lot of white. I'm going to take a small detail brush. I'm going to mix these three together. And you want to create a nice brown color. Mostly yellow and red. Little bit of blue. And start sketching our landscape. What you want to do is you want to start off with your horizon line. Now we're doing a vertical canvas, so there's very little sky in this particular painting. There's so much foreground. We're not going to concentrate a lot on the sky. If you've noticed, I've also toned my canvas already. That's so that I don't get a lot of reflection and I can see the colors a little bit better. I'm going to let this color uh, show through in my sketch and possibly even to the end of my painting. So I'm going to be very careful how I cover this up. Now what I want to do is take my finger and blur my sketch down just a little bit so I don't have a hard line to follow. I want to keep it real soft so I can move it up and down. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to concentrate down towards my foreground. And what happens with a lot of people when they're working outdoors is that it's hard to get something so spectacular, so huge, on a little tiny canvas. So what I often recommend doing is start painting in the foreground and then place that hugeness behind the sketch that you do. That way you leave enough room for the foreground and you'll have just the right amount of space for the background. So we're going to actually sketch the foreground first and then further on into the distance. You want to take some time in doing your sketch to make sure it's somewhat accurate. We're going to change it as we go along. I'm going to place in some of the shadows. Then
This canyon is so immense that what you need to do is shrink everything down so you can get it on your canvas. And what I recommend doing is first focusing on the foreground. Try to get all the little details in the foreground. Get the rocks and the positioning of everything you want in your painting and then gauge the rest of the canyon in the relationship to all of the things that you've got in the foreground. You'll see it's a lot easier to try to get angles off your main rocks in the foreground than it is to try to guess out there in the canyon somewhere where your mountains are supposed to be. So I'm going to bring up the whole foreground about this much into my composition. Then I'm going to work into the background. And I'm going to place these mountains where they are in relationship to my sketch. So where this mountain comes down to this rock, that's where I begin my sketch upwards. Taking my time, double checking and rechecking. And now the placement for my background mesa. And again, I want to leave the option open to change this at any point. But I'm paying attention to where this mesa comes down to this rock. Don't be afraid of making a mistake. You can always just take your finger and just push everything around. Like I said, you want to be able to change as you go. And what I should have done was actually gone from this rock in the foreground out and then gauged my mountain. That's one great thing about working with paint as a sketch as opposed to a pencil. You feel more free just to push it around until you get it just right. You have to make sure that everything on your canvas is smaller than what you see in nature. You have to shrink everything down. The tendency is to paint everything too large. And if you want to get the whole scene into your painting, you're going to have to start shrinking everything down. When you sketch with the foreground first, it's a lot easier to try to shrink things down in the background. You get a better sense of scale. There is so much in this canyon to paint that you have to pick and choose. There's no way that you could paint everything that you see. So what you need to do is focus on the main highlighted areas. The rest of the areas will probably tint with just a bluish color and put it all into haze. But one thing you have to remember that usually when you're outdoor painting, you usually spend two to three hours on a location. Any longer than that and the light will change too dramatically and it's an entirely different painting. So what you want to do is focus on the details that are important and the rest of it leave kind of to the imagination. Now there's all these little cliff formations back here and I'm going to worry about putting the detail back here later but there's definitely a line for my rocks in the background. And I'm going to spend some time on this sketch to make sure it's absolutely accurate. As you can see, I'm trying to get all the detail in my foreground rocks. I want to spend some time, really get the feeling that I'm looking down on these rocks. An outdoor painter has to establish to the viewer a sense of place. So they have to recreate the illusion of what it would be like if you were to stand at the edge of this canyon. And part of that is that you have to give something for the viewer to stand on. I always recommend really concentrating on your foregrounds. A lot of artists make the mistake by having the, the foreground just disappear or feel like you're too close to the edge. And if you don't have the viewer to stand on something, it's very uncomfortable for them. They get an unsettling feeling, just as if you would walk up to the edge of this vast canyon and stand on the edge. So give your viewers something to hold on to. Foregrounds are also where you start establishing the viewer and the direction you want to take them throughout your composition. Now, in this particular case, the, the viewer will start off here, and I'm going to purposely manipulate them to go into my canyon because I'm going to have this very vertical wall over here. And with those verticals, 
the viewer will be pulled into the composition and then pulled back into my main focal area, which will be this peak in the background. There's a lot of haze in this valley, and actually it's kind of good when we're doing something this complicated because it simplifies a lot of the little detail. Throughout the day, this haze is going to change color into a bluish cool color. Later on it will get warm. Depending on the time of day that you go out and paint, when you have a situation like this, use it to your advantage and ask yourself, do I really want to paint all that detail out there or can I let some of it just disappear into the haze? There's a dead tree towards the right of my composition. I'm not sure if I'm going to put all of that in. I'm just going to put in a little footnote to see how it works. Sometimes it's best to leave these things off because they distract from the rest of the composition. So I'll make a little footnote of it, but we may not use it. In fact, I'm going to hide it just a little bit. Just so that it reminds me that if it feels comfortable, I'll put it in. If not, I'll leave it out. Those are, the, those are the options that the outdoor painter has. Now I'm going to switch to a larger brush. And one of the important things about painting, especially early in the morning, is that you have to indicate all the shadows. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to paint in, in a much larger fashion, a sketch. Mind you, this is still a sketch. But what I'm doing is I'm putting in all the areas that are going to be my shadow areas to remind me later on where the shadows go. As the afternoon progresses, the light will be shifting and these shadows will be shifting and some of them will disappear entirely, changing the scene from what we see right now. So what I want to do is I want to very quickly take a large brush and very quickly start putting in a lot of these shadow tones. And there's definitely a direct line that the sun creates at the edge of the, the canyon in the distance. All of these formations sticking out into the canyon, all are casting shadows. So what I'm doing is I'm creating all these shadows at exactly the same angle. That helps tell the viewer how high the sun is. You can almost follow the shadow and find out where the sun is. And what I'm using here is just cobalt blue with my color that I mixed up, that brown tone. So it's kind of a brownish blue. Not very accurate as far as color at this point, but it's cool and that's what's important. And again, this is very thin. It's a very thin wash. I want my whole canyon to be in shadow. Trying to remember what it looked like the moment I came out here. Trying to keep that impression in my mind. All these cool colors. What's beautiful about painting the Grand Canyon, and especially from the North Rim, is the combination of cools and warms. It's amazing how, how a vista like this could have so many cool, wonderful bluish tones and then be contrasted by strong oranges and reds and yellows. I think really that's what makes the North Room so spectacular to paint is that it gets this phenomenal color of reds and against all these blue colors it's just amazing. I'm going to take some more of that blue and I'm going to very quickly just put a stain in for my sky. I'm trying to get a feeling for what the whole painting looks like in my head before I proceed. Sometimes I go out with my students and they're so anxious to get painting that they overlook the sketch and they get things incorrect. And consequently, they've got to spend an hour or even an hour and a half at the end of the session recorrecting their sketch when it could have been corrected the first 10 minutes. So take your time. Make sure the negative and positive shapes are correct. Make sure that these, these shapes, the, this air in here, this negative shape of the canyon against this positive shape of the rock in the foreground, that this area in here feels correct. That this little saddle, this little step here feels correct. That this opening feels correct. Spend some time recorrecting and look at these negative little holes that are peeking through. That's what's going to help you get the right scale of things. I'm taking my 
turpentine and just wiping out a little bit of that rock jutting out. I'm going to take some time and mix up a darker variation of my tone to put in all the little cracks and crevices in my rocks. It's always good to try to get a lot of these dark areas in first. And I'm also going to put in the shadow for some of my trees in the foreground. These colors are hard to get once you have paint all over your canvas. And we want these to be cool and dark. And the best way to do that is to put them in thin at the beginning, almost transparent, and then try to retain that throughout your painting. Your highlight areas will be very, very thick, but your, your shadow colors will be very, very thin. So what we're doing is we're actually applying the shadows first. Once you get white into your painting, it's hard to get these dark, wonderful shadows, especially if you want the shadows to look transparent. White has a tendency to be opaque, so it works better as a highlight, but as shadows, you want to keep it very dark and transparent. Also, my foreground is also in very much shadow. So what I'm doing is I'm taking a wash over my foreground and I'm darkening it. I only want a little bit of light, the very tip of my ridge. And maybe a feeling of some shadows of trees outside of my picture falling over my rocks. The rest of this is all going to be in shadow. And see, I can indicate that just very quickly, just with a wash. And now with my sketch done, we're ready to start painting. I'm going to put my little detail brush down and pick up a larger brush. And I'm going to mix white, cobalt blue, alizarin crimson, and a little tiny bit of yellow. We want to create a blue-gray. This color primarily is blue and white a little bit of lizard and crimson, and a little bit of yellow. Mix those colors together, add a little bit of turpentine to it. Make it smooth, but make a big pile so that you can use it for a lot of things. Now you want to paint this area kind of a grayish color. There's a fire nearby, so it's causing the sky to be a little bit hazy. And take that exact same color, add more white and a little bit more yellow. And as you get down to the horizon, put it in a lighter color. As the sky reaches the horizon, it gets lighter. I added a little bit of yellow in there to get it warmer. And you want to create the feeling that the sky is getting warmer as it's coming down to the canyon. And just blend that right into that grayish blue color. Just blend it so it's nice and soft. And then take almost pure cobalt blue and just paint the top of your canvas with pure cobalt blue. Just take the blue and go right along the top and darken the corners. So for the most part the sky is kind of a grayish color. Bluer towards the top and lighter and warmer towards the bottom. Use lots of paint and then just blend it evenly. Now there's a little hint of clouds in the distance. This color is alizarin crimson and yellow with lots of white and are just going to hint the clouds just above the horizon. Just has a feeling of a little haze and clouds resting over the canyon. Right in the middle, I want to get a little bit brighter, so I added a little bit more white, just to get a little more glow. We want to create the feeling that the sky has light into it. And by adding a little bit more yellow, it warms up that haze and gives a little bit more interest to your sky. I'm using lots of paint, very juicy strokes. Just try to get that sky just to glow. Now with our sky done, we're ready to start working on the canyon. 
The canyon is exactly the same color as the sky, except it's darker. So what we want to do is create a darker tone of our original sky color, and that was cobalt blue, alizarin crimson, and cad yellow. Remember, mostly cobalt blue. It's kind of a bluish color. Add white to that tone, but not as much. We want it darker, and we're going to start painting the large area of the canyon in first. I'm taking advantage of the opportunity to recorrect my sketch whenever possible. And since I'm working in the negative shapes of the mist, I can reshape and sculpt the foreground rock. And I'm going to create the illusion of mist all in my canyon. So I'm just going to drag that, that bluish gray tone right up into my canyon. And you can see by having a little bit of paint in the background that I already feel like part of my painting is already there. That I've already got the, the basic color in for my rock formations on the other side of the canyon. I'm going to separate all of my mountains with this bluish haze. The Grand Canyon can be very, very complicated, but you can eliminate a lot of the detail just by bringing in the haze that comes up off the valley. And if you're not sure, and that's the, the reason why you want to go out in location and paint, is that the, the haze constantly changes. And if you're out here in the canyon, pay attention to those changes. Pay, notice how the, the lines disappear and reappear and areas disappear and reappear. We're going to concentrate primarily on the shadows. All of these shadows have the same color. So, especially in the background, we want to make sure that all of these shadows are exactly the same tone. So, start them off at the base of the canyon, where the, the intense shadow is, and slowly work up. We're going to try to leave the canvas bare where the highlights are on the far ridge of our canyon. But in the foreground, we want to create a nice, deep, canyon with lots of mist and shadows and and subtle forms. Now remember what I said early on that these shadows are going to be the same color as my mist in the valley. And I'm going to bring them in the same direction as my sketch. I also said that all these angles were going to be exactly at the same angle. So you want to be sure that this angle and this angle are exactly the same. I'm going to bring that right up to the very edge of my sky and I'm going to blend it. You don't want a hard edge on the edge of your canyon. Just slightly blend the edge. I'm going to bring that color all the way across. I'm going to separate my left hand rock formation and my canyon. So what's going to happen is that this big, huge, massive edge of a canyon on the other side is going to be lifted by all this mist. The whole thing will be shrouded in this wonderful grayish mist, almost releasing it from the canyon and causing it to float. Making the whole scene just feel like it has a lot of atmosphere to it. And then lightly blend the edges into your sky, just so it feels like there's a haze that just drops into the canyon. Now I'm going to put down my big brush and pick up a small brush. And I'm going to start paying attention to all the little details on the other side of the canyon. And just with this blue, you can cut into your base color and just create the feeling of cracks and crevices. All of these details have little tiny characteristics that make up that other wall of the canyon. You want to create the illusion that this part of the mountain is considerably closer to us and parts of the canyon are considerably deeper 
and away from us. And you do that by making this line a little darker, a little bit more pronounced. Likewise, you can create the illusion of some of the trees on the far side that break up the edge of this canyon. They horizontally go straight across that rock formation. And you can see that very quickly you're recreating the entire canyon with just a few brush strokes. I can also take my brush and use a little bit of turpentine and wipe off some of that bluish color that I just put on and create a little bit of light in the background of my canyon. Now what's going to happen is that the base color that I painted the canvas is actually going to bleed through through my my bluish haze and you'll see that it will create the the illusion of a canyon on the other side being lit up very softly by light. Remove areas with your turpentine and expose the color underneath and actually give the feeling of a painted canyon already without having to put in all that paint. You just wipe off a little bit of the blue with turpentine. You can see the exposed, the exposed canvas underneath with that brownish shade that I had originally painted in when we started. The nice thing about this is that there's just a little blue haze left on the canvas that creates that haze in the valley. It's not really bright, so you don't want to have these colors real strong in the background. You can wipe and pick up and push around your paint, put dark details in, and dark shadows. There are going to be areas that I want to pick out right along the top of the mountain where the mountain juts out from the background. Gives the illusion that this part of the canyon is a little closer. See, I'm just picking up a little bit of that edge with my brush. I want to try to soften all my edges also, because the best way to create the feeling of, of atmosphere is not to have hard edges. So just very softly blend. And I'm using a bristle brush, and it's kind of a fallacy that that you have to have really expensive sable brushes to work with oil to, to soften and blend. Bristles work really nice. Um, you just have to be sure you have a lot of paint on your canvas. You have to have something for the brush to grab a hold of and, and mix together. A little mountain popping up here. I'm gonna Bring that out. Just wiping off the blue color and, I, and exposing the mountain underneath. This is why having a good sketch to start off with helps. Because you can kind of see the sketch through the paint. I'm adding a little bit more blue paint where I want the shadow to be a little bit deeper to pop out an edge of my mountain. So my haze is getting a little deeper in there. It's easy for a landscape artist just to get totally lost in the entire awe of what they're looking at and not focusing on their time. So you have to be reasonable with how much detail you want to put into the background because you have to realize you still have to have time to work on the rest of the painting. Now with our detail done in our background, we're ready to start doing the next layer of mountains. I'm going to still work with a small brush, but I'm going to darken this value. So what I'm going to do is take this same color that I used as the mist and darken it by adding more blue, a little less white, 
and start painting in the shadows of my mist. Now this layer is darker than the layer behind it. I'm going to switch to a large brush and I'm going to do this whole area in a larger, larger manner. Again, just like with my background mountain, I want to shroud the base of my mountain in mist, causing it to feel like it's just levitating over the valley. A lot of these angles coming together are not necessarily going to be pleasing. It just gets very complicated. We only want to focus on the main parts of the canyon, which are the peaks. Meanwhile, everything falls in this beautiful purplish blue mist. Switching to a small brush, we'll take that same color and do exactly what we did in the background mountains. Just pick out the deep shadows and the detail without painting in the mountain itself. We can actually create the illusion of a mountain just by putting in the shadows. This canyon is made up of layers of sediment. Each layer of this canyon is a different color. The layers in the background, this higher area where it has more yellow, is a different sediment than what's down here in the canyon, deeper down below. Taking this darker base color and forming the different layers of rocks. This rock has a little more detail, so what I'm going to do is mix up a little brighter color. This is my yellow and my white and my alizarin crimson. And I'm going to start painting a little bit of the detail. I'm going to let some of the underneath color show through, but I also want to create some of these neat mountain tops. And just pick them out. Don't put a lot of paint on this. Just want to create just a little bit of detail so that it stands out from the background. These mountains are closer so they can have a little bit more detail on them. I'm going to let some of the purplish color actually show through and that's going to be the shadow area of my rock. For those of you that are paying attention, you notice that I've gradually shrunk this mountain down. Um, as I work on my sketch, I realized that my original sketch was much too large. So slowly but surely, by pushing the mist down into my sketch, I recorrect it. And that's important to remember. You have to constantly be correcting your sketch and allow yourself to correct. Otherwise, the first decisions that you make could be the worst decisions that you make. Constantly correct your sketch as you go along. At this point, every little detail counts. You're actually painting the painting, stroke by stroke, and make sure that every stroke you put down is absolutely correct. It takes less time to do it right the first time than to erase and redo it, and erase and redo it. Constantly correcting yourself in small little bites now we'll put all the detail over here. And when I say all the detail, I don't mean every single rock. If you have to, squint your eyes and just paint the, the larger shape of the form. You don't have to paint every little rock that you see. Just make sure the form is correct. I'm really making sure that this color is definitely darker than the one behind it. You may have to adjust it just a little bit back and forth to get it just right. But it has to be darker and cooler, which means there's a lot of blue. Paying very close attention to what I see out here, making sure that every brush stroke is absolutely correct. And again, we're going to just blend the edge off of this peak. 
I've introduced a little bit more white just to get a little bit more atmosphere in my canyon. A little bit lighter down at the base. That way the whole mountain just feels like it's just floating on air. And I'm carefully going around at this point quite boldly around my sketch for my tree. We're going to take this color and work around the tree area. We do have to make sure that as this color reaches the edge of my mountain, that the edge of the mountain remains dark because we want to silhouette the mountain against the background. So this definitely has to be darker. Pay very close attention to form. Make sure it's drawn right. Get this color down deep into the canyon. And just like we did before, we take a small brush and we start painting in all of the detail that we see. Now what I'm doing is I'm recalling this mountain when I first started the painting. And all this area was in beautiful, beautiful silhouetted layers of, of shadow. So what I have to do is try to recreate that memory. And remember that sketch I put down originally had a lot of blue colors in there. So that reminds me that this whole area is going to be in shadow. So we don't want a lot of highlights. Just let all of this disappear into darkness. Lighten up the base, give a little bit more atmosphere, and carefully go around your tree in the foreground. I'm going to try to retain some of my dark color that I have down in my initial sketch. So I want to be sure that I don't go over it because it's going to be very difficult to get these nice dark dark colors once I get paint on the background. So I'm trying to retain most of my sketch for my foreground. And I'm going to slowly nibble at this sketch just to get the feeling of needles. And see the tree is already popping out. A little bit more blue. I love getting this glow as if there's a little bit of light coming through the atmosphere and hitting and reflecting down in the canyon below and then coming back up highlighting this wonderful bluish mist. The contrast of cool colors against these warm colors really makes this an exciting place to paint. I'm going to mix up yellow and blue together, mix up a nice green color. This will be little hints of trees. We're actually this mountain is starting to come closer than the other mountains, so you're going to see more detail. So with this bluish green color, mix it into your purplish color that we used as a base. That initial color that we laid in. Just let them mix together. And since we're only using three colors, these colors will mix very well together. Hopefully creating the feeling of an area of sagebrush and trees that grace this hillside. And I'm going to flick the brush lightly upwards to create the illusion of a soft edge. Because all of these trees give the forms of, of little points and little round curves. So soften the edges. Now I'm going to add a little bit more yellow and white. I'm going to start putting a little bit more detail in my cliff area here. I've got to watch out that I don't do too much detail because this area here is not 
the main focal area. This is just a support for my main light area in the center, which I will probably brighten up towards the end of the painting. But for right now, I want to create the illusion that there's just an area of rock that's jutting out from all of my trees, going straight up. Every angle that trees can grow on, you want to kind of put that in. The trees grow on a diagonal angle. Wherever the mountain is diagonal, that's where you'll have trees. So put a little detail in at an angle so that the trees look like they have something to hold on to. All the vertical areas are painted vertically. And you wouldn't put any trees there. Now notice the lines are actually the color that I had underneath. So they'll pop out. And right now there's a little bit of light hitting the tip of that. So we'll make this brighter right here just so that it pops out from the background. I'm gonna introduce a little bit more red. And right now, I like the light that's on this mountain. This is a little bit later in the afternoon, but this mountain will look to me as being very significant. And spend some time here just really putting in all the cracks and crevices. This will take a little bit of time, but it's worth it. Okay, now with all that in, we're ready to start putting the highlights in on these rocks. Taking my time and putting these rocks exactly where I see them. I'm going to introduce a little bit more yellow in because I've decided that I want to make this my main focal area. So I really want to bring the light into it. Some horizontal and vertical strokes to help break up the movement of my brush. Now as this gets further down, we want it a little darker and let it disappear into this mist of blue. Most people are intimidated by this huge, vast canyon, but once you, once you realize that you can simplify a lot of it, it's not such a great mystery. And to be out here and listening to the birds and having this whole place to yourself really makes the experience wonderful. And now with all my details done in the background, we're ready to start working in our foreground. And I want to show you that I can pop out a rock. A few brush strokes. So what I did was I highlighted the top of the rock and now I'm just putting in a little shadow. Remember the shadow has a little bit more cool color in it. I like thinking of rocks as boxes. You don't want to think of them as big round objects because they'll end up looking like huge potatoes in your painting. So think of them as boxes with angles and shapes and forms and sides and bottoms. And we're just going to highlight the rocks just at the very edge. And you can see how much brighter that is than the highlights previous. Now with that done, we're ready to start putting in our branches. Now where these branches go up against the blue, really take some time and do some beautiful little forms. Be very careful at this point. Now the reason why I can get such fine lines is because I've got lots of turpentine on my brush. Now some of these branches are light. They have a little bit of light hitting them. And now with all the little branches done, we're ready to start bringing in the foliage. Just drag the brush slightly over your canvas. Notice how I change the angles constantly. My brush is going in all different directions. You do want to try to concentrate on that light that we first saw when we first came out here. The rest of it is done in a little darker color. So I'm going to introduce more blue, just bring a little bit of variations of color into this bush. Other areas I'm going to very carefully put in a few little sky holes into my tree and cover up some of those orange areas. And see I can create a lot of branches just by putting in negative shape. A little bit of time and careful brushwork. Start seeing the whole thing start to take shape. 
a little bit more white just at the tip. I want that light to really be strong right there. Notice I'm just using the tip of the brush. Now with our foliage done, we're ready to sign the painting and conclude this wonderful day at Grand Canyon. I want to thank you for coming along with me on this wonderful journey to the Grand Canyon. If you'd like to have more information about my workshops in these magnificent places or my private workshop at my ranch in Mount Shasta, please just go to my website at www.stephanbauman.com and there you can get more information about my workshops and my YouTube videos and my blogs and my PBS show the Grand View. There, while you're at my workshop, feel free to register for my free book, Everything I Know About Painting. It has insights and ideas, and it's absolutely free if you go to my website. And you can do that again at www.stephanbauman.com. But if you really, really want to get your artwork to the next level, I highly recommend personal coaching. I'm a personal coach to over a hundred artists and the work that they have achieved under coaching is extraordinary. It has really made a difference in their artwork. And if you'd like to read some of their testimonials, you can do so at my website. But better yet, why not just give me a call at 415-606-9074. That is my personal phone number. You can reach me there 24-7. And feel free to text me if you're a little nervous about making that call. Again, that's 415-606-9074. So till the next time we meet, always remember to paint with passion. I'm Stefan Bauman, and you have a grand day.